The typical ratings for such a device would be that it only needs to block DC current flow up to a threshold of 2 or 3 volts. Why? Because pipeline operators would not normally have a CP voltage any higher than that, and one wouldn't want to have a threshold very high as to be unsafe. At the same time, the DC leakage current through the device should be extremely low. Ideally, it would be zero, and it almost is for the typical solid-state device. It's well less than a milliamp at any typical voltage, or even at the threshold, not more than several milliamps. The AC steady-state current that can flow through the product, being mitigated continuously, is commonly in the neighborhood of 45 amps, AC RMS. And the typical fault rating of the device is in the several thousand to perhaps 10,000 amp range. While lightning current ratings can be very commonly 75 or 100 Ka as the peak value. Devices are commonly rain tight or submersible depending on where the product is located, either of which could apply. And the most common hazardous location is generally classified as Division 2. There are some Division 1 locations where hazardous gases are expected to be present all of the time, but that doesn't tend to be the majority of sites. The decoupler purpose, in the end, is to limit the induced AC voltage on the pipe continuously and provide overvoltage should there be an abnormal condition, such as an AC fault or lightning strike, but under normal conditions, it should block CP current, which is DC. There are additional guidance documents and criteria for overvoltage protection. The NACE document SP0177 recommends limiting voltage on pipelines to 15 volts. Keep in mind that 15 volts is a human health risk and is basically a steady state condition. It doesn't guarantee protection for AC faults and lightning, and a totally separate topic is any level of mitigation needed to address AC corrosion. So keep in mind, this is steady state conditions, the kind of conditions where you could go out with a meter and measure at any particular point in time and measure steady state, not fault conditions. AC mitigation practices are to use matting at facilities and test stations near where there could be induced effects or fault effects. So anywhere there'd be a high voltage AC corridor. It also is good practice to use such facilities as mats at any location where there could be over voltage conditions. Again, they're usually used for step and touch voltage, but they aren't going to be low resistance AC grounds for mitigation. That would come from other grounding systems that one would install specifically for that task. The AC mitigation grounding system would be the system that is a low resistance ground. Ideally, you'd have that installed where it does not affect CP. That's where the decoupler comes in. And one can test to determine what these effects will be. If one was to bond temporarily, safely, to an existing grounded object. It could be a culvert or a road casing, could be a fence. Something that represents a low resistance ground, you would see the effect of what happens to the induced AC. You'd find that it gets collapsed to some degree. The degree to which it gets collapsed depends on how low of a resistance the grounding system is. You can also then measure to find how much voltage is, results and is present and what kind of AC current is available through this coupled source if you use a clamp-on AC ammeter. A couple of diagrams might help illustrate this. This would represent the open circuit voltage before mitigation that exists between a pipeline and some grounded object. In this case, just a driven ground rod for the purpose of a test. One has to be careful though if that ground were not considered to be a very low resistance ground, then this may not be the best, best example. For open circuit voltage, this grounding rod will be perfectly fine. It may not represent, though, a low resistance ground for bleeding off current. If one was to bond, though, and assuming this is a good low resistance ground, 
you would find that there's current draw, and you could measure that with a clamp on AC ammeter. This is just a temporary test, and you do need to do this safely, uh, because current will be drawn as soon as a cable connection is established between the pipe and the grounding system. So observe safety precautions as you do such a test. Now the final installation consists of having a decoupler of some type installed and connected between the pipe and that grounding system. This would block DC current flow but still conduct that same value of AC current. The reason it would still conduct the same value of AC current is because the impedance of this device is so low it's almost a short circuit for AC. And again, the grounding system design that one uses really should be designed by someone familiar with your soil resistivity and conditions and install an appropriate grounding system for those soils. And that could consist of vertical rods, horizontal conductors, deep wells. There's many choices depending on the soil conditions. The final design for AC mitigation is to have a grounding system that's an acceptable one. An example of something not to be used would be the transmission tower footings. They will be fantastic grounds, but the entire system is going to work in reverse when there's a fault or lightning strike, and now a direct bond is going to bring that current and unacceptable voltages straight to the pipe. So one would not do that. This is a separate grounding system that consists of vertical rods or horizontal wires or other appropriate systems that are just there for mitigation. The decoupler is then used to provide that DC isolation while still bonding for AC between the pipe and the grounding system. You also need to think about other objects that are on a pipeline where there is induced AC that needs to be addressed. Some obvious things would be an insulated joint. That joint insulation is clearly subject to overvoltage conditions and voltage must be limited, so consider where there are taps off of the main pipe or joints in series in the pipe. Also think about casings because there's a close proximity to a very large grounded structure. Also examine where your pipe goes relative to substations and towers as to provide mitigation for any effects in those vicinities. In the end, the result will be that the AC voltage is limited and you've created a controlled current path for lightning or fault current or steady state current between the pipe and the grounding system. So the safety problems have been addressed in this story, but decoupling is going to prevent there from being a negative CP effect. And also, if we did this appropriately, we'll not have created new hazards, such as bonding to towers. Keep in mind that there's other locations that can have voltage differences that exist. We did just talk about insulated joints, where you could, without mitigation, you could have arcing, there could be shock hazards. But think also about insulated measurement lines and stations. Is that insulator the only thing that separates the pipeline from a grounded station? Then that could arc across if that wasn't addressed. Also think about proximity between piping and station grounding systems or fences where an arc could get established. Something that people don't think about as much would be the voltage gradient in the earth. So consider step voltages anywhere piping is exposed and uh, could, there could be a touch voltage from the exposure. There also could be a voltage gradient in the earth. In vaults, that generally is considered a grounded structure, and there's contact points that could exist there. Casings we've spoken about. Even wells that represent a very well-grounded structure um, should be separated from, say, cathodically protected piping, usually with an insulated joint but one would want to protect against voltage differences there. And towers and substations themselves are sources of electrical phenomena, and they may be the return point for faults that affect a pipeline nearby. Some things to keep in mind. When you're testing, remember that if the pipeline has not had mitigation yet, an open circuit voltage exists, and you'd want to measure before contacting that pipe. After mitigation, keep in mind 
that if you have uh, conductors established for mitigation, if you break that connection, you're going to be open circuiting that pipe. And so voltage will rise to whatever is the unmitigated level. So be very safe as you perform these kinds of tests. Keep in mind also that for any pipe that's not had the mitigation performed, under abnormal conditions, such as fault or lightning conditions, the voltage in that pipe is going to rise to extremely high levels. So keep in mind, if you measure 5 volts on a pipe and don't think that that's much of a level of concern because it's below the NACE criteria of 15 volts, just remember you measured that under steady state conditions and when there's a fault, that voltage on the pipe will not remain at 5 volts. It might rise to 500 or 5000. So that's the reason mitigation systems are needed and that's the reason that conductors and decouplers all have to be rated for fault current. So please operate safely as you perform these tests. There's a couple sources for useful information on these topics. I've already mentioned NACE SP0177 and that includes wire charts and sizing, it includes human health conditions and criteria, and safe practices that also can be downloaded from the NACE website and NACE members already have access to those free of charge. Another document that can be useful, NACE document 35110, is a state-of-the-art paper on AC corrosion, a slightly different topic, but could be very useful. Also, NACE.org has a number of papers over past conferences on AC mitigation in general. The Dairyland.com website has a number of technical articles and data available, sizing criteria, etc. And DEI also can be contacted for any basic guidance on this type of work. I'll touch on one last topic. It isn't directly related to safety concerns on pipelines involving AC mitigation, but it is a related discussion that should at least get some attention, and that is the risk of AC corrosion for a pipeline. If one was to look at this graph, you'd see AC voltage graphed on the vertical axis against resistivity on the horizontal. And AC corrosion criteria is considered to be at a level where the amps per square meter, basically the current per square area, leaving a defect, is above a certain level. Generally, when the current density is above 100 amps per square meter, that is considered a region where AC corrosion is very likely to occur. Between the range 20 amps per square meter and 100 is a gray zone where it has been observed that corrosion may occur or may not occur, depending on the conditions. Or below 20 amps per square meter, it's considered to not commonly occur, to not be a risk. If you look at this graph and consider that the NACE criteria for mitigation is 15 volts as a shock hazard, and now look at where the line for the 100 amp per square meter, in this case the green line, is graphed, you'll see that there are plenty of conditions possible where you could be less than the NACE criteria of 15 volts and still be in excess of a current density problem above 100 amps per square meter. Mitigation on your pipeline might need to be taken all the way down to 5 volts, depending on your soil resistivity, or even lower in order to deal with the issue of AC corrosion. 